Hello and welcome to RNF Unlocked, a podcast series that gives you exclusive insider access to the Crypto Data RNF MotoGP team. Join us as we take you behind the scenes of our journey in the World Championship, sharing exclusive insights and highlights from the track and beyond. Get ready for thrills, spills and everything in between as we deep dive into this exciting race with Crypto Data RNF MotoGP team. My name is Neil Morrison, I'll be hosting today and I'm delighted to say that I'm joined by Razlan Rizali, team principal. Hi Razlan, how are you? Very good, thank you. And also Wilco Zielenberg, the team manager of uh, the RNF uh, MotoGP team. Hi Wilco, how are you? Hello, good afternoon. <laughs> so gentlemen, we are here in Argentina on the eve of the Argentina Grand Prix, the second round of the season. Um, and there is a lot to discuss because, I mean, last weekend in Portugal was uh, a crazy weekend. There was a lot going on. Um, we had a new structure. We had exciting racing. We had Miguel actually leading his home race. There was uh, so much going on. Um, Wilco, to start with you, how did you find the new structure? Um, I mean, because there was a lot going on, a lot of time changes, a lot of changes in general to the, the format. Yes, yeah, uh, clearly, um, well, first of all, I think uh, the show was good, but, um, you know, uh, leading the race, of course, we are very thrilled about that, and, and having the results uh, after the last couple of years were, of course, not uh, fantastic, but uh, we are very happy with that. Uh, the new format, I, I think, will give, uh, or has given some, some struggles, especially uh, because we started uh, directly with them, you know, because everybody was on zero points, everybody's nervous, and then clearly everybody uh, made mistakes. And uh, it's difficult to say why, but anyway, they have been made. And uh, the reason or the, the result is that four riders are not here. So, of course, we are not happy with that. Yeah, absolutely. Raslan, um, for you and your experience as the team principal, how did you manage last weekend? Because obviously there was a lot of changes to the format, as we just mentioned. A lot more pressure, I think, on some of the technicians, maybe on the riders as well. How did you find kind of managing everyone in Portugal? Well, I think, first of all, you know, I come from a promoter's background. And this new format by Dorna is something that we've been talking for at least the last three, four years, the need for MotoGP to be more engaging, exciting. Uh, of course, we always compare it to Formula One. So I think this is a knee-jerk reaction to do better. So I think the format, in my view, is, is exciting for the spectators, uh, for the TV audience. And the format enforces Formula, uh, Friday session to be crazy intense. You know, everybody wants to qualify for Saturday session. Uh, so that makes Friday exciting. Then Saturday, of course, with the qualifying and spin race to get more crowds to come for Saturday. Of course, it's too intense for the riders, uh, too intense, hard for the mechanics as well when they crash on Friday, uh, especially if they crash on uh, Q1 and Q2 uh, to prepare the bikes for the sprint races. While it's good, while it's positive, um, I think there should be a little bit of fine tuning. I think the effect of the last weekend after talking to some people is that uh, it's great, but you need to fine-tune a little bit to make sure that people don't go overly crazy, I guess. But yeah, in terms of, sometimes we forget that when we came on Friday, we have the spring race. Uh, so we don't know how to prepare until we go through the weekend. Uh, but already, if there's crashes, our guys are working uh, overtime that we've never uh, done before. Uh, when we had with the Yamaha bike, you know, I think like Wilco said uh, last week, you know, the Aprilia bike, you minimum, if everything is in order, we are spending one and a half hours more on the bike, you know, so that's something that we are getting used to. Yeah, Wilco, um, Razlam was just saying there, the format needs to be fine-tuned somewhat. Do you agree with that? And what tunings, uh, what changes do you think would be suitable? Yeah, I agree with that. So uh, clearly they have been working a lot and uh, of course the sport is, is, is on a move and uh, the whole world is on a move, I would say. Yeah, to do more races is, isn't you know, more is not always better. And uh, this is uh, yeah, something they also need to, I think we need to learn. Of course, uh, the adjustment could be that there is so much stress on the Friday, but we should not forget also the free practice three that looks like, ah, yeah, but there's a free practice, but that free practice is 10 minutes be before Q1. So the riders are actually more nervous in FP3 because they can't crash, because otherwise they don't make you one or two, you know. So uh, 
yeah, the whole practices followed up, brings a lot of tension to the boys, and uh, th yeah, they, they have a lot of concentration uh, uh, they need. Yeah, they, it costs a lot of concentration to, to go through that process. So uh, for me, it, you know, looking, you know, that the sprint race will be there, but if they are able to do the Friday uh, with a little bit less pressure, for example, it could be that it's a free practice. I know that they also want to have more action on the Friday. Well, action we had, but also we are still, again, we were missing four riders, you know, for this round. And uh, yeah, this is not what we want to continue with, you know. So Yeah, there's no rest, basically, not for yes. riders at any point over the weekend. And um, as you say, every session, there needs to be a result at the end of this, which is putting them under tremendous strain, I guess. Yeah, correct. So last year, uh, if you look to those weekends, they uh, had to qualify and, and push uh, like maybe over the limits, uh, maybe three times a weekend. But now for sure it's six or seven times. You know, we have seven soft tires and they use them all. And as you saw the lap times in Portimao, uh, in the test, uh, Peco did 37.9 and everybody was like, whoa, lap record and how fast and blah, blah, blah. But then finally, during the race weekend, I think there were 11 guys in 37. So the level is, is unbelievable high. So talking about the format, I mean, being playing the devil's advocate, you know, World Superbike Championship, they've been having races Saturday and Sunday. How was it? They, they were coping okay? Was, was, there, was there resistance when it was first introduced? Or then everybody just getting used to it? Or is it just that the intensity between MotoGP and World Superbike is just so different? I don't know, but I only can say that I followed always Superbike, except when they started to do two or three races. Now I can't, I don't follow it anymore. It's too much. There's too much going on. There's too much points difference in a weekend. I'm not able to follow it up anymore, and it's just too much in my eyes. And I can only talk for myself. And I hope it's not the same case for the fans uh, behind the television, because and, and, and on the grandstands. Because one MotoGP race, it gives a lot of effort and attention. It's one race, one go, and now there is a second one, you know. And if the people losing interest, instead we creating interest, is exactly what we don't want. So let's wait and see. Razlan, do you agree with that? Do you think um, less is more? Well, no, not necessarily. I mean, um, to me, the Saturday show was nice. I think it was great, you know. I mean, it created the building up for Sunday. It's as if like Sunday became an uh, anticlimax because Saturday was so intense, and then Sunday, okay, until after the crash with Miguel, is an anticlimax because it's a longer race. But I would support certain things that Dorna tried to do to make the race weekend for MotoGP interesting. I mean, what's interesting is that Stefano De Marcali from Formula One was there last weekend, and then the next day he announces that maybe the free practice for Formula One will be scrapped to make it more exciting. You know, so is that because he saw what he saw in MotoGP? I, I don't know. But then again, if you compare Formula One and MotoGP Formula One, they're much more safe. If they crash, they're safe. Yeah. You know, our, our, our sport, if we crash, if they crash, you're lucky to be okay, right? But again, it's only the first weekend. Let's see this weekend. And hopefully we have a injury-free weekend. <laughs> Yeah, so you mentioned this weekend, obviously we're coming here, you guys only have one rider, Ralph Fernandez will be your sole entrant for the Argentine Grand Prix because Miguel unfortunately was passed unfit. How is Miguel doing and um, do you have a, an idea of when he's expected to recover and be back? Well, on Monday they made an MRI and uh, basically the doctors uh, declared him unfit and uh, looking to the injury he has, it's, it's not broken, but uh, the bruises and everything and the blood inside the, um, the joint, is, it, normally that takes 14 to 15 days that it's really gone. Of course, from now this moment is a little bit difficult to say because if he is declared unfit on Monday, uh, you know, I, I have no idea. I'm here in Argentina how he is at the moment, if it goes better, but clearly he's able to walk. And um, I think the blood circulation, like having some heartbeat training on a roller, you know, so on a bicycle, I think that will help a lot. But uh, very difficult to judge if he's capable to ride. I guess yes. Somehow deep in our minds, uh, we, we have this feeling that he might not be unfit. Just that when we saw him on Sunday, coming back to the garage, I mean, he's walking very slowly. But then we also saw a video that his father took that he was walking in front of doctors, doing a bit of squats and all that. We thought, oh, maybe there's some chance. But looking at the incident, it's a big hit. 
you know so yes we are disappointed but it's important for him to recover but also deep inside we know there was a chance that he might not be uh, unfit already yeah absolutely obviously huge disappointment whenever Miguel was taken out of the race because he was in second place at the time he led the first lap of his home Grand Prix which was fantastic to see and fantastic considering it was your first race full race with Aprilia as well um, you mentioned that four riders aren't here this weekend there was some crazy riding not just in the sprint but then in the main race as well was some of that riding over the edge in your eyes will go well I think uh Yes, for sure, but I think it all has to do with the platform and the, the format because everybody is nervous and uh, it was also clearly uh, that Mark qualified pole, but he didn't have the pace, you know, so he did the sprint race well, but clearly he struggled to, to be there and to stay with there, so that also made him nervous in my eyes. And uh, when he uh, yeah, had pole position, of course, for, the, for 25 laps and you don't have the pace, you need to do something really fantastic in the first couple of laps to stay with them, otherwise they're gone. And that's what he did. He's a trier, and a, you know, he's Marc Marquez, you know, so I have a lot of respect for him. But he made a big mistake for a eight-time world champion. He made a big mistake. And I think he also realized that. And uh, all the riders are making mistakes. But clearly, my vision is that it also came from the format that he followed during the Q2. He had a fantastic lap. I have to say that too, and he was surprised, but he was on pole position, but he did not have the pace. So I think it's all to do with the format and the nerves that they have, these boys. Razlan, one or two MotoGP riders said last Sunday that they need to maybe just uh, be slightly less aggressive. Now, obviously, it's difficult telling a rider to not be aggressive in a, a racing situation, but do you feel that... Um, Riders need to maybe just tone down the kind of aggression that we saw in, Port in Portugal. Well, I, I, I can't really say that because you know, I mean, Wilco will probably be best to answer this because, from what I know, is that the moment the MotoGP rider put down his visor and start racing, they forget everything and they just want to race. However, I think that if they know that if it's reckless racing and the penalty is severe, you know, it could change their mindset a little bit. I mean, uh, Wilco mentioned something very interesting with Lorenzo when he was in 250, when he had uh, two race bands. Yeah. You know, so his thinking, his mentality of racing is different because if he does something stupid, then he'll be a race band. So I don't know, maybe the format has something to do with it, or maybe this lingering of a severe penalty, they do something reckless that if they do it, they'll get one race band or two race bands, then that could calm them down a little bit. I don't know. How do you really calm a rider down and not to go overboard or push him? Well, clearly uh, it's a mentality thing and um, you know to switch off is something they not really do but of course in the last lap action and, and uh, if it comes for the podium or for a race win we all want to see battles but if it's the third lap of the race and the whole package of the group is still together it doesn't make a lot of sense to attack a group in front of you of three people and even Mark didn't want to do that, I, I, is my feeling. But he was very close. We know Mark and he likes close racing. And if the group is bigger, uh, you will take more people down. In the past, he did also some mistakes, but then it was one to one, was one rider. And then uh, he pushed him wide or he touched him a little bit or whatever. But now the level has grown so much and so high, there are more riders around Mark Marquez and then more people are on the floor and of course that's that's important that uh, you need to ride and race with the mentality to win that race but not in the first or second lap because that doesn't make sense i think that's where it's all about you're not leaving spaces open for other riders but you can prepare an overtake very well or you just go blind into the next corner and you say i want to grab this guy you know and uh, yeah that's a complete different mindset so you think that if the riders know that if they do something reckless, irresponsible, and with that penalty in mind, do you think that will make them think differently when they race? Yes, 100%. Yes. So they know what the rules are, and together they make the rules from uh, if you touch this and if you do that, and then you get this penalty, and I, I think they shoot themselves in the foot. But anyway, I saw uh, two years ago that action from uh, Dennis Onku and he, he get two, two race uh, yeah. bands. And compared to Mark's penalty, that Mark's penalty is a joke, you know. So, uh, as I said before, uh, Dennis' uh, penalty was 4,200 seconds. 
two races. I calculated that. And Mark's penalty was five seconds. And uh, yeah, for me, that, that that's, uh, yeah. Anyway, he accepted the penalty, but I can imagine because for me, it, it is no penalty. So the final result in Portugal was obviously disappointing for you guys, but there were so many positives to take. It was the first time that you were racing with Aprilia. We didn't just see that your package was competitive. We saw at different points during the weekend, your riders were looking competitive as well. I mean, you must be looking at the positives and thinking there is a lot of good things to come this year when we saw Miguel leading his own Grand Prix. When we started off, when we planned for... Yes, we are. We are very positive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we, we are positive, for sure. But over the weekend, we were hoping for something a little bit more deep inside, you know, because of the progression of our riders, especially Miguel. The biggest chance for our new riders to do something special is at Miguel's home Grand Prix. So we, have, both of us, we have this sense of 2019 all over again. But for me personally, maybe I wanted so much because we went through a lot of bad results for the last two years. We started off well in 1920. So when we have a new package, new bike, new sponsors, new riders, we have that sense that, wow, this is going to be 19 all over again. And yes, Friday was bad for both our riders, but Saturday, Miguel came back and we saw the sprint race, how he can fight for the podium and of course the last lap is another thing and then we thought this could be it you know so when that happened you know I was so pissed off it's just unbelievable because for me look as a team principal running the team we are desperate for results you know we know it will come but the best chance is always at Miguel's home Grand Prix so that's my feeling yeah I don't feel that because I have a little longer history and uh, for me the main thing is that uh, yeah, as you already said, we were leading the race by a lap and uh, looking to the last couple of years, this is already uh, amazing, you know, and also if you see the challenge and, and the factory teams and the amount of money everybody's spending, so we need to be very proud about that. And uh, if we are able to lead races in the first race, we will be able to lead in other races, is my opinion. And this is the main thing, so that makes me a lot calmer than, than Raslan because yeah, he looks more to the daily result and I'm look like, like, we have the speed. If you don't have the speed, you come nowhere and we have the speed, so it, the results will come. And it's not easy. And as we saw as well in Portimao, because basically, uh, yeah, Miguel has been taken out. He did not make a mistake. It was not over the limit. No, Mark took him out and uh, yeah, you have to live with that. So we need to stay professional and accept it and, and go forward and look to the positives, you know, because, and, and that's a big positive when you have the speed. And the same is for uh, Raul, you know, he qualified uh, not very well, but he has a lot of pace and uh, he, he fight with uh, Fabio and uh, clearly he's in his mojo, he's uh, yeah, growing fast and uh, I think we will see results from him uh, coming very soon. Uh, so this is a, a fantastic thing. Absolutely. A uh, very successful four-year relationship with uh, Yamaha, Raslan. Oh. And now this is a new chapter with Aprilia. Can you talk a little bit about how things are different now? Uh, how is the relationship with the Aprilia factory? We see Massimo Rivola, the CEO of Aprilia, down in your garage, and there seems to be a quite a close connection between the factory and, and the satellite squad. For me personally, the biggest difference between Yamaha and Aprilia is the direct communication and the transparency that we have with Aprilia and Massimo. Okay, this is my point of view. I mean, Wilco has been working with Yamaha for the longest of time. In fact, I need him to be convinced to switch to Aprilia. My point of view is that with Aprilia, it's a direct communication with Massimo, who is hands-on in developing the bikes. Compared to the other side, you know, you always deal with the middlemen, and you don't really know what they're doing. We never was presented of what strategy or what they're developing. We don't know. With uh, Aprilia, the first meeting I had with Massimo about the chance of a satellite team, the first satellite team, he was very open, he was very transparent. And when I arranged a meeting with Wilco, they had all the guys who built the bikes, the, the engine guys, the aerodynamics, the electronics guys, and the communication. We speak English, it's easy to speak to them. For me, my four years with uh, Yamaha, we, we don't speak anything about how the bike's being developed. 
And then when it comes to on the ground, we have the guys coming in and out of our pit box. We have Massimo always come in and have a look, get involved. And the best thing for me as well is when Paolo said, you know, when we set up the pit box, we don't want a wall between the two, the two teams. And that's amazing. So they want to be able to go in and out and all that. And that is something like, I'm, I'm, I'm like, wow, this is, this is awesome. So you feel a bit more appreciated. They want us to be successful. Okay, they want us to win. They want us, if we can, to beat the factory riders. So this is the kind of feeling that we get from them, which is awesome compared to before. Yeah. And from a technical side, Wilco, I mean, obviously, Ducati are clearly the, the top dogs currently in MotoGP at the moment. But we saw last weekend that Aprilia are really not very far away at all. Maverick yes. was second in the, the feature race on Sunday. Miguel could have possibly been fighting there at the front for the podium as well. I mean, the RSGP is a super competitive package currently. Yes, you're right. Uh, of course, there are uh, seven Ducatis and three Aprilias, but uh, after every test, there were eight Ducatis in the top ten, more or less. You know, so that means if they are able to set up correctly and you have two or three days, they are having a very com uh, complete package. But they don't have that. They have just the Friday and the Saturday. Tomorrow they say rain, so it's not so easy. They have a very fast bike, but it's also a very complicated bike. So they need more time, many times. And Portimao, we had a test, and I would like to see how it is going. And I think uh, in that sense, the Aprilia is a little bit more forgiving. That means more like the Yamaha bike everybody likes, and it's, uh, the base setup is quite good at every track. This is sometimes easy to forget and we shouldn't because it's very important at the moment. And just before we finish up, uh, I'd like to hear both of your opinions on Raul Fernandez. We haven't really mentioned him so much in this podcast, but he's coming from a really difficult 2022. His rookie season in MotoGP wasn't at the level that I think everyone expected. Um, but he's come to your team. He said now that he's happier than I think he was at any point during last year. He's enjoying riding the bike again. Uh, we all know he's super talented from his experience in Moto2. Um, how have you found working with Raul so far, Razlan? Well, first of all, I, I leave all the development the advice, racing advice to both Wilco and Noe. Uh, but we wanted Raul uh, as early as uh, 22, you know, until the point that we were fighting with KTM or he ended up with Raul fighting with KTM. But I liked him since uh, his motor two days. So we are very happy that he's with us finally. It's quite a deja vu because I was on the same flight with him, sitting next to him and I said, wow, Raul, you're fighting with KTM and finally you're here with me. So he's happy in that sense. Uh, but then when it comes to the actual racing, I think I leave it to the experts, to the, the most experienced in how to get the maximum out of his performance. I think that's the base. Of course, uh, we were also smart enough to pick up Noe when uh, he was not allowed to go to Tectois. And of course, that, that was also, it, it is like that a lot because uh, they, they are like a patch. You know, uh, I, I've been riding as well. And when as soon as it goes well, you, you connect to your crew chief and uh, you only have a couple of words with each other and you understand each other. And uh, that helps a lot. So if then somebody else decides, no, it's not possible because A, B, C, D, then you're disappointed, you know, especially if, if you don't get the results you want. And uh, anyway, he was, uh, of course, set up in the wrong lineup already when he had a no to some request that he had, you know. And that can be difficult. I mean, when a rider maybe has the feeling that he doesn't want to be somewhere, then it's, it's going to be a difficult uh, challenge to get the best out of him, right? Yes, 100%. So I, I think it was the plan was, was clear for KTM. They wanted to keep him. They are no his talent as well. But I think that you know his request to be with us on the Yamaha last year uh, made them a little bit nervous. And then they uh, refused because they invested in him. This is also clear. But also they need to realize that uh, to keep the rider like they did is also useless because he could not perform, he, he hurt himself and he lost confidence completely. And for us it took uh, three days in Sepang, you know, Valencia after the season was not very good because uh, he was not ready to jump and uh, he had to forget the season. But in Sepang it took two days and he was fast. And Razlan, there was an issue with his arm uh, in Portugal, is that correct? Um, maybe there was a feeling that his leathers were too tight or, or there was something prohibiting him in the race? Yeah, that's what we were told. He had a problem with his shoulder that leads to numbness to the right side of his hand and 
maybe that causes him to crash. So maybe because of the leathers, something that he had the same uh, problem when he was in Moto2. I think he did some adjustment on his leathers, so let's see. He had his shoulder treated for the last two days. He's feeling good this morning, so um, yeah, we'll monitor the situation. Okay, and just finally guys, before we wrap up, we are in Argentina. This obviously was a very good track for Aprilia last year. Alicia Spargaro scoring the first ever Why Aprilia did you need to mention that one? <laughs> <laughs> MotoGP victory. Now, I'm not trying to build up expectations too much, but I um, guess I'm trying to say that this could be a good weekend for Raul if he, um, if he manages to feel okay physically. And um, yeah, well, how are your feelings? <laughs> no, no, you're right, you're right. I already said he's on a good flow. And, uh, you know, it's difficult to predict, but uh, our main target is to qualify better than Portimao because he was on P20 and he did four tenths better than he ever did before in Portimao, but it was not enough. So he was not slow and his pace was actually better than his qualifying lap. But this is sometimes more difficult to prove, you know, because uh, uh, the qualify lap is so much faster than the race pace. And then clearly he went to P11. And then, uh, yeah, he get this arm numbness feeling, so he had to give up a couple of positions. And uh, finally, he crashed, so that was not, of course, what we wanted. But in, during the practices and, and also the sprint race, he had no problem at all. So uh, I expect this is another racetrack, less demanding. And uh, yeah, first of all, we need to qualify better. And for the pace, uh, I think this is another story. He has the pace, and of course, we are on another track, but the qualifying is our main uh, priority at the moment. For me, I, I trust the process of Wilco and Noe to guide uh, Raul. The Argentine Grand Prix is totally different from Portimao because Portimao we had the test before and then we come back for the race and it's totally unknown for Argentina. Again, the format's the same. I think from FP1 people try to do something to qualify. For me, I just trust the process between uh, Wilco and uh, Noe to guide Raul and do the right thing. Okay, well, I wish both you guys and your team well this weekend. Uh, thank you very much, Raslan, and thank you very much, Wilco, for joining us. And that's a wrap on the first episode of this podcast. We hope you enjoyed these exclusive behind-the-scenes insights. Don't forget to tune in for our next episode, where we'll bring you even more unlocked access from Crypto Data RNF MotoGP team.